Good morning. I, I was really kind of hoping for this big, elaborate introduction. I hoped for it. I knew I wasn't going to get it, but I hoped for it, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's been a while. seems like forever since I've been here. Uh, it's not been forever, but it, it seems like a long time. And, and sure glad to be back and see you. I um, was with familiar faces the whole time, have been. And um, love the people of Christian Unity Association and you know, when we talk about Christian Unity Association, most people think that uh, they're all in North Carolina, but they're not. There are three churches in Virginia and four in North Carolina. And uh, I actually stayed with a, a couple in Virginia, so I didn't spend a lot of time in North Carolina. But they'll feed you down there too, trust me. They really will. Uh, the revival was such that we traveled from each church each night. We went to a different church. We did not get to go to Wolf Knob. And as I tell people, the name ought to tell you where it's at. It's right on the top of a knob, and um, uh, it snowed pretty much every day. By lunch, the snow, the road would be pretty clear, but Wolf Knob is on the west side of Wolf Knob Hill, and that always gets more snow, and uh, we were supposed to be there Saturday night, and uh, uh, Brother Cecil Roop called and said, you can't make it to the church. We can't go there, so we thought that would be it, but then they got their heads together and decided to go to a nursing home where Brother Rex Hall is at. Uh, had some exciting times in North Carolina, and those of you who don't know, I left North Carolina and immediately went into revival in Jamestown, Kentucky at Mount Hope Church where I used to pastor. So I could go back there today. And uh, Brother Anthony will fill in, and I appreciate Brother Anthony. I really, really do. Uh, my youngest daughter called me uh, three weeks ago today and said, where are you? And I just, I like to aggravate my kids. I said, what's it to you? <laughs> she said, well, I have my phone set so that when Facebook Live comes on Edinburgh Church, it gives me a notice. And if I'm not busy with a patient at the hospital, she says, I, I turn it on. And she said, it wasn't you. <laughs> I said, you're right. She wondered who it was, and I explained. And we appreciate Brother Anthony stepping in, and he'll be stepping in again tonight. I appreciate that. Uh, let, let me tell you three of the great highlights that I had in, in uh in being gone in Virginia and North Carolina. Most of you know that, uh, that I love music and I do have a, a small guitar collection. It's not that big. Um, I used to name them. That one's number 15. Uh, that's flat tops, that's not electric, so that doesn't count everything else I've got, but um, I don't need any more, but I'm still shopping, okay? But um, uh, I had the opportunity one day uh, that week to meet a guy that is, um, I call him a super picker. He can absolutely play a guitar. I'm not going to tell you his name. That'd be advertisement, okay? Um, but he's been on TV. I like that every time he comes on and I can watch him, I do. Uh, he's played in Carnegie Hall. That tells you how good this guy is, okay? And not only that, but he is a world-renowned luthier, which means nothing to most of you, but that means he makes guitars, you won't find one in a music store anywhere. He makes them specifically for people. And I was staying with his first cousin, and I knew that. And one day, uh, we were out, and he decided that we need to go stop and visit his cousin who was going to have surgery. And so we took a right turn. Instead of going to his house, we went to this other house, and as soon as we pulled up, I recognize this guy's shop because I've seen it toured on TV. And I thought, oh my goodness, I get to meet him. I'm so excited. <laughs> Went into the shop and there was a young lady working in there and he said, but, uh, where is, and he said the guy's name and he goes, she goes, oh dad, he's late, I'm on Doc's pay. I thought that sounded like one of my kids. She was out there making a, uh, uh, I think she was making a mandolin. She, she makes several things like that, but anyway, uh, we walked toward the house, and he came out, recognized him immediately. We were introduced, and this fellow I was with said, you know, this guy here, he kind of, um, he kind of trades, uh, he, he, he collects guitars. Can you show him your guitar collection? I thought, oh, cool, I'm going to get to see his guitar collection. We went through his house and into a vault. He literally stopped there and opened the door on this vault, and we walked into a room that was about 20 by 24, and the walls were absolutely lined with Martin guitars. I'm like, I'm in guitar heaven. 
Without saying a word, he reached down, opened a guitar case, handed a guitar to me and said, here, play this. And I looked on it, it had his name on it. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> his guitars sell for an average of $30,000. He said, yeah, I just finished it yesterday. I think it plays pretty good. I wanted a second opinion. I'm like, I'm the guy. <laughs> So he picked up another one and we played for a few minutes and I'm telling you, I was in guitar heaven. I could tell you more stories about it, but uh, not a Christian, but he needs prayer. Super nice guy and I, I absolutely enjoy it. That would be my third most exciting thing that we did, okay? Second most exciting thing was to go and spend some time with Brother Rex Hall. Some of you remember Brother Rex. Wonderful man of God, 90 years old, can't walk anymore, is in the nursing home. And uh, I got to go one day and spend three hours with Brother Rex, and he was so alert. And he even asked about some of you and called you by name and wanted to know how you were doing. So Brother Rex sends his love, and that is absolutely something that outweighs being in guitar heaven for two hours, okay, uh, to be with Brother Rex. And uh, Saturday night, that's where we had our service at, was there, and we had Brother Rex open for us, and, and he did a devotional, and, and he led in the prayer so blessed with being with a great, great man of God. But the greatest of all highlights of the week was seeing three people saved. I mean, you can't ask for better than that. It was wonderful. Enjoyed it. Really did. And uh, uh, God's good. And, and this, this fellow that I met uh, and, and talked with him about the guitars, we got talking about people we know. He's, I said, I know you've made them for famous people. He said, oh, you wouldn't know any of them. And he started naming them. I'm going, yeah. I know who that one is, and I know who that one is. And, and I said, well, now, you know, I'm not bragging, but I have a really distant cousin, so distant, in fact, that he knows my name and I know his, and that's about it. <clears throat> but he makes banjos for people, famous people, you know, like Roy Clark and Buck Trent and Bela Fleck and all that. He said, what's his name? And I told him, he said, I make a banjo once in a while, and I call him and buy my necks off of him. He said, next time you're down, bring him with you. So I don't know. I'm going to have to hunt this cousin up and bring him down. I don't know. But uh, to see people saved is wonderful. And then, of course, immediately left from there, drove back home, went into revival at Mount Hope. We've seen people saved at Mount Hope. So it's been a really, really great time. But I've missed being with you guys. I'm glad I'm back. And uh, I'm, I'm, I even expected all the harassment and even more. So if you have it, throw it my way. I'm, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we've been in the middle of a series, you know, about uh, becoming a Christian. And if you're going to get in this thing, you know, you're going to stay with it no matter what. And uh, we did take a break last couple of weeks. Brother Anthony, I noticed I keep up with him on Facebook and he didn't preach about it. So we're going to go back into it. We're going to ask you today to turn to Acts chapter 10 and uh, going to read the whole chapter because that's the whole story. Uh, now, this took place uh, sometime after Pentecost, of course. These people are... Uh, the church is beginning to grow, okay? And uh, uh, Paul has been converted, so it's been several years since this took place. Uh, up until this point that we're going to read about, the, uh, uh, the idea of people being Christians and the gospel being preached was exclusively to the Jews. That's, that's the only people they were reaching out to. But that's about to change in this chapter, okay? So if you've got Acts chapter 10, we're going to start at verse 1. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of a long reading. Um, I, I pick on the folks in North Carolina and in Kentucky. Of course, I live in Kentucky, so I've learned how to speak that language, you know. But um, I told them in Virginia and North Carolina that I was going to slow down reading to their speed. They felt insulted. I said, no, seriously, you guys talk too much slower. I can't read as fast as I do in Indiana, and I have to slow down in Kentucky also. Uh, first night I was at Mount Hope, somebody came up to me after church and said, you need to slow down your reading. You've been in Indiana too much. <laughs> and I said, well, I've been in Virginia and North Carolina. I thought I was reading slow enough. They said, no, slow down. So we'll be able to read a little bit faster today, okay? But stay with me. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band that is called the uh, Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God alway. He saw in a vision, event, uh, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he had looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. 
And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and draw nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodging there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men that were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee, into this house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up! I myself also am a man. And he talked with him and went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I ask, therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, while I was fasting until this hour, at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send, therefore, to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter, he lodgeth in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent for thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. 
and we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. That's a great story, ain't it? Now, we ought to appreciate that a lot because, because I'll, I'll just be frank with you. That's the first time the gospel was preached to the Gentiles. That's pretty great. It's pretty great. Now, you might be inquiring in your little mind, what's this got to do with getting in this thing and staying in? What's it got to do with it? Well, what I want to talk today about is spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment. How do we see spiritual discernment in this right here? Well, let's take a look at Peter. Peter was raised a Jew, okay? He'd grown up, and he was trying his very best to live by the law and tradition. Now, I realize that I might say some things here that'll ruffle your little feathers. Too bad, right? You guys all know me. I don't, I don't, if it messes with you, that's all right. Stir you up a little bit, okay? And if you get mad, too bad. Peter grew up a Jew, doing the very best he could to obey the law and tradition. Here's where the spiritual discernment is going to come in. The law, what is the law? Well, if we go back, we can read. I mean, the law is primarily contained in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and it's repeated in Deuteronomy. What is the law? It's what God says that is right. And a lot of people think that all the law is is, is, is a bunch of just don'ts, but it's also some do's. God tells them what to do. He also tells them what not to do, Okay. Peter has endeavored to live by that. Now, understand this. Peter's not a well-educated man, okay? Uh, we learned that when he and John have put in jail for preaching the gospel. Because the rulers of the people, when they go to talking about Peter and John, it, it said they took note that these men were unlearned and ignorant. So they didn't know a lot of things, okay? Only what they had been told of the law. Okay, you got that? The law's good, by the way. It won't save you, but it does tell us God's opinion of what's right and what's wrong. He lays it all out, okay? And just so you'll know, it's pretty clear, and it's in black and white, okay? A lot of questions today about moral issues. Is this right or is that right? You know, look in the book. It'll tell you what God's opinion is about things. And even Jesus, when he was here, if you remember about a year or so ago, we did a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus tells us again in the Sermon on the Mount, what's right, what's wrong. You, you can read that, you know, in, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, okay? Uh, re recall that. Some of you may have forgotten, but Jesus spells out right and wrong, doesn't he? That's what the law will do. Peter's trying to live by that law. Quite frankly, I wish a lot of other people tried to live by some of them, Okay? But Peter is trying to do that now. I, I said tradition also, right? Didn't I use that word tradition? I think I did. If I didn't, I should have. What tradition is that Peter's living by, and, and let's just be open and honest today, we do it too, right? We do it too. 
Tradition is, is what we think is right or wrong. Now, did you catch the difference between the law and tradition? The law is God speaking to us about moral issues. Tradition is what we think. Okay? Let's take a look here, and this is where we want to get, get started real good, and I, I'm going to try not to preach too long because i got to drive back to Kentucky here in a few minutes, okay? After, am I going to your house to eat Maloney, Jimmy? I might not get baloney. <laughs> Didn't sound like it, but that's okay. I'll forgive you, brother, okay? Look at verse 28. Peter has seen this vision. God's been speaking to him. He follows God's leadership, and he gets down to this house, and, and I want you to notice the first thing he says to Cornelius. It's negative. This is not the way you're supposed to start a speech or a, a message. It's negative. He said, you know how that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was Cornelius, I'd have said, well, then what are you doing here? Wouldn't you? Well, let's, let's look at that for a minute. I, I'm not going to exhaust you, but you know, I, I did the research on that statement to find out, is there really such a law that tells the Jews they were not supposed to go into the house of a Gentile or to talk to them or to have any dealings with them? Is there such a law? You know what the answer is? No. No, there's, there's no law. I mean, you can go all the way back into Exodus, and, and God does indeed tell them that when they get into the land they're going to occupy, to either run those people out or to destroy them. Never says they can't go to their house. Never says they can't eat with them. Never says they can't have any business with them. And by the way, I trace that all the way through the Old Testament. And not once does God lay down a law that says, don't have anything to do with them. Not once. Now it tells them not to marry them. It tells them not to worship the same religion. It tells them a lot of stuff like that. What's the problem here? Tradition has taken over. Tradition. By the tradition of the Jews, the Gentiles were not worthy to even be thought of that God even recognized them. Tradition had come to the point that they would not speak with them. Remember when Jesus uh, over there in, in, in John's gospel says to the disciples, I, I must needs go through Samaria. They're like, oh, we can't do that. No, them Samaritans, they're, they're half-breeds, and, and we can't do that. We, and Jesus said, no, guys, you've got to understand, I need to go through Samaria today. Now, why did he need to go through Samaria? You guys all know the story. To talk to the Samaritan woman who was hated by all the Jews. Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that Peter being there, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and preaching and testifying to the other Samaritan people that were there, you'd think Peter would have got the hint, wouldn't you? But he's stuck in his tradition. We can't do that. We, we can't fellowship with them. We can't go visit them. Boy, we don't even know that God respects them. That's the attitude that they had. Has the church ever had that attitude? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, I, I tell you, I grew up in a church that was very strict about a lot of things. Of course, you know, the, the years when I grew up, we were rebels, and so we tried to break as many of those rules as we could and get in trouble. You know, I don't think we tried to get in trouble. We did, you know. I mean, rules such as... Uh, <clears throat> Girls, your hair has to be worn this way. Guys, your hair can only be so long. To which I said, oh yeah? Watch me. You know, we, we kick on those things, and, and, and I know some of you think, well, it's, a man shouldn't have long hair because Paul said, doesn't nature itself teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair? Paul didn't say nature teaches it's, it's a sin. He said it's a shame. I was a rebel. 
I had long hair. But you know what? God loved me anyway. We, we were told how to dress according to the tradition. Here's how you've got to dress. Okay? I'm so sick of hearing how Christians ought to dress. Cover yourself up. Be modest. Absolutely. Do I think you ought to clean up and come to church? Yeah, but if you can't, come anyway. Okay? You see these traditions that we, we've done the same thing to people in our time that the Jews were doing to the Gentiles in Peter's time. There's not a law that spells it out that they can't talk to a Gentile. There's not a law that forbids them from spreading the message of hope of God to the Gentiles. But they had come so separate from the rest of the world. And yes, God did call them out and make them a special nation. He did, okay? But he never intended for them to keep the good news to themselves. Never. And so Peter, man, he's, he's in a fix here. God's saying to Peter, you need to go. And Peter's saying, wait a minute. I've never done anything like that. And I'm not fixing to today. See, this, this sheet that is left down to Peter three times has more to do with going to the Gentiles than it does what Peter can eat. It's got more to do with it than that, okay? And I know there's people in the church world today that like to restrict what you want to eat, okay? I know that. I mean, there are denominations that want to live by the old Jewish dietary laws. You know what I say? Have at it. You want to be a vegan? Have at it. But leave me alone. I like ham and biscuits. I like catfish. Okay? Bacon, sausage, all that stuff. They can, I'll eat a squirrel once in a while. <laughs> or a rabbit. Now, some of you is frowning, but they're pretty good. You ain't never had any before. <laughs> We're not even going to get into the possum delicious things, Okay? Of course, everybody here knows the joke with the, with the possum thing, right? We, we were riding to church one night, and there was a dead possum in the middle of the road. And I said, stop the car, John. He said, why? I said, supper for tomorrow night. And I had to explain myself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't recommend possum. It's not real good. But what I'm saying is this. Tradition had taken over Peter so bad that he looked down his nose and had determined that there were some people that were not even worthy to hear the gospel message. Have we not done that in churches today? Boy, we have, haven't we? I have this fear that, that we as organized religious organizations, I, I have this fear that we have run more people off because of our tradition and our ignorance of the will and the mind of God than we will ever see saved because we have formulated in our minds that these things are wrong. I've shared this with you folks before, but we got people that might be watching on Facebook and that's all right. And some of you here haven't heard this before. I got used to the evangelist coming and preaching on my long hair. It didn't bother me. If I had long hair today and somebody wants to preach on it, that's fine. I had one lady at the first church I passed her say, why isn't your hair long now? And I said, sis, haven't you looked? It fell out. <laughs> she figured that out. Okay. Took a while, but she finally got it. Okay. <laughs> By the way, when I started pastoring 39 years ago, I did have hair and I lost it in that first pastorate and I've always blamed them. Okay. But, but I, I got used to that, okay? But let me tell you, that, that one revival, when that evangelist came in, and I don't even think I know who, I don't remember his name. I don't. But me and him didn't get along a lot of nights anyway. But that night he got preaching on my bell bottoms. That, that, just, that just was enough. I mean, he plainly stated that they were wrong, they were sinful, and if God had intended you to wear bell bottoms, he would have flared your ankles. That's what he said. You know what? And I think he firmly believed that. I really do. What was, that was tradition, wasn't it? That was his own thinking. Now, he could have run me off, I guess, but I was too stubborn. And I remember looking at him as I went out the door and shook hands with him. And I said this. I said, you can preach on my hair all you want, but you leave my bell bottoms alone. Yeah, tradition. I, I can just tell you this today, standing up here. Uh, there are not many of you sitting back there had been welcome in the church I went to growing up. 
You men ain't got your top button buttoned. You don't have a suit and tie on. If you don't, you better have that top button buttoned, and you better have long sleeves on. And you ladies better have a dress that covers your knees. And some of you have absolutely cut your hair. Man, that was a visit from the pastor of the church I grew up in. You just didn't cut. You hear what I'm saying? There's no law that tells us any of that stuff. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you know there's no law that tells you how to dress? No, there's a church down the road from me. Some of you know it. Purdy Separate Baptist Church had a problem years ago. They, they created a committee to find what the Bible said about how you ought to dress. You know, they looked and looked. You know what they came up with? Dress modestly. That's what God expects. But our tradition that we have conjured up and listen, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad Edinburgh Church doesn't mind if God comes in and we just change the order of things and just worship God. That's a good thing. But listen, there's people in churches, you can absolutely upset them and destroy their whole week if you change order of service in church. Why? Because that's the way it's supposed to be. Right? Now, I could elaborate for longer, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry you out, okay? That's the way Peter was raised. Yes, he knew the rights and wrongs, and we need to know the rights and wrongs. But we need to have some spiritual discernment to figure out what is the world of, rule of God and what's our opinion and our tradition. Because if it's just our opinion and our tradition, we need to have enough spiritual discernment that we turn away from that and allow God to move. It's what Peter did. It's what Peter did. He makes that bold statement, and I, you know how I am. I like to double-check these statements, and as I look back and research and trace all the way through, step by step, anything that had anything to do with dealing with the Gentiles at all, it never once says that it's unlawful for a man that is a Jew to go into or have company with somebody of another nation. It never says it! But tradition had told him he couldn't do it. Imagine the shock as he sees this sheet let down. Three times God had to speak to Peter and say, it doesn't matter what you think, Peter. If I've cleaned it up, it's good. Look at the last part of this verse. It's going to move us to our next move here, okay? But God... I like that. Do you know, but God is throughout the whole Bible. And the word, but we talk about it once in a while. It means with exception. Peter understands what the law says in his tradition. And I think he's got them crossed and he thinks they're both the same and they're not. Okay. They're not. But all of a sudden he says, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That's spiritual discernment. I know how I was raised. I know what I think. I know what I have told myself and taught myself and maybe been taught. And I believe what is right and what is wrong. But let me tell you something. When God speaks and show you differently, you need to have some spiritual discernment. You need to be able to say, now, I've believed that all my life, but, but, you know, does it really line up with the Word of God? This is where Bible study comes in. You ought to be able to look back in the Bible and listen, if you can't support your position on what you think is right and wrong by the Word of God, you need to throw your tradition and your thoughts in the garbage because they don't belong to God. But God, he said, Showed me. God showed that to me. Did you notice in verse 34, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Man, Peter's lived all of his life thinking God was a respecter of persons. Do you know God's willing to save anybody? Everybody? God's not a respecter of persons. It irritates me to see these people who have a lot of money and are in positions in government and power and authority that think they're above the rule of God and, and, and that, you know, they are not going to have to answer to God. God. They're going to have to answer to God just like you and me. 
And by the way, I don't care how ra raunchy they are and how filthy they are and how nasty they may live their lives or, or how their per personal political slant is. Makes no difference. God can save them. And here we are in our little world trying to live by our rules. Kind of like Peter. Right? Kind of like Peter. I want to take you over here into Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 2, at what Paul has to say about this. And, and, and really, you know, it kind of, well, it's like a lot of other things that Paul said. Peter said it, that there's some things that Paul wrote that are hard to be understood. But I hope you'll understand this today, okay? Over here in Colossians chapter 2. Paul, Paul's letting us know, and, and Paul had to learn, just like Peter did, that, that he needed to go to the Gentiles. We need to learn that, that we don't need to discriminate against anybody, I don't, I don't care who they are. I don't care what color they are. Listen, prejudice uh, against a person's color of their skin does not belong in the church. Does not belong. Never has, never will. Prejudice against people because of their social standing does not belong in the church. Does not belong. Do you hear me? Prejudice against people because they can't dress like you. Maybe they don't have any money. Maybe they don't have the clothing, the resources that you do. That prejudice does not belong in the church. If I haven't got some of you mad yet, I will. Give me time, okay? Because we lived by that for too long. I'm trying to wake you up. Spiritual discernment. Jesus Christ died for everybody. Not just for the ones you think are worthy. Okay? Uh, get over here to Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Well, I wish we had time to read more of this, but we're going to kind of cut it short. He said, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Now, notice the parentheses. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using. Now, you notice the little parentheses, don't you? He said, that's the way people are living. H how, much, how much have we heard that in our world? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Oh, don't touch that. That's, that's not right. And, and I'm going to tell you, there are some things we don't need to mess with, but I'll tell you this, when you get saved, you won't want to mess with them. You have a change of attitude, okay? But, but listen, we're not under the law. We're under grace here, right? Paul said, that's the way you're living, okay? And then he goes on, after the commandments and doctrines of men. I'm going to mess with you just a second here, okay? You know when there's a parenthesis that that's nothing more than an explanation. You can take that out and the sentence will still make sense. So let's take out the parentheses here for just a moment, okay? Paul said, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to order and ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of who? Men. Who made up the doctrines of touch not, taste not, handle not? It had to be man, he said, because they are going to perish with the using. One of these days, they're going to pass away. Only the ordinance of God will remain only the commandments of God. And we can narrow those down, can't we? Remember the lawyer that came to Jesus and said, Master, what's the great commandment? Jesus narrowed them all down. I mean, he just took Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and grouped them in a little package and said, The first and great commandment is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. And he said, The second one's like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know what he's saying? If you'll learn to obey those two, you don't need the rest of them. If you'll learn to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, you don't need that law that says thou shalt not kill. Why? Because you're also going to love your neighbors yourself and you won't want to kill him. You won't want to commit adultery. You won't want to go around lying. Why? Because you love God and you love your neighbor. He wrapped it up in one little package. And what Paul is saying here is we're still getting so many crazy rules to live by when all we really need to do is love God and love our neighbor. Let's go a little further in that. Let's listen here in verse 23. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of, of the body 
not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. You know what he's saying? He's saying, it's, you want to live by some of that stuff? That's all right. Okay, if that's what you want to do. Just don't push it off on everybody else. Now, let's go on into chapter 3 because this goes right along with it. Here's one of those divisions I don't like, okay? And we're not going to go into why it's all divided up like that, but you, you, most of you I've told, okay? Now, listen to what he said. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. And if you stop and think about it just a little bit, Boy, some of the things that we have made rules and regulations about and we push our tradition on so much have got absolutely nothing to do with heavenly things, but they have to do with earthly things. Isn't that scary? That we have let our opinions and our thoughts about earthly things supersede the love and the law of God? That's scary. Peter had to turn his back on his tradition. You know why? Because his tradition was wrong. His tradition was wrong. You see, Jesus said this to Nicodemus when he's testifying to him about being born again. And Nicodemus is a little confused because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, and he had been a stickler at keeping the law. But he's not born again, and Jesus said he had to be. And, and, and Nicodemus says, how, how can this be? And Jesus said these words, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. It wasn't natural. It wasn't physical that need to be born again. It was spiritual that need to be born again. And Peter had to learn that on the housetop in Joppa, that God is not so much concerned with what you eat or what you drink. My goodness, did Jesus not say that, 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 that it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles your body. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles your body. Listen, Paul said that, that, that our Christianity is not meat and drink, but it's love and joy and peace and the Holy Ghost. We stress on some things too much and forget to use spiritual discernment to find out what really is right and what is really wrong. And Peter understood that day, it's not wrong to go to the Gentiles. It's not wrong for you to dirty your hands and reach out and help somebody who doesn't attend this church. It's not wrong for you to go to the house of the drug addict and testify to them. Listen, you say, oh, I can't do that. Well, then Peter, why did he go to the Gentiles? No different, is it? It's no different. If we're going to get in this thing and live for God... We're going to have to have some spiritual discernment about what we need to do and when and where we need to do it. And not sit back and stick by our tradition and say, well, we've never done that before. Let me tell you something. When God says do it, you need to move. Can you imagine what would have happened if Peter would have said no? Now, I know some of you just automatically thought, well, God would have sent somebody else. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know that God's going to send somebody else to do the work that he's asked you to do? And it may be something that you don't want to do. I don't mind telling you, I'll, re I'll remind you over and over again, I did not want to preach. I did not want to preach. But that's what I needed to do. I kind of like it now. But I didn't want to. Peter didn't like the idea of going to the house of a Gentile. I think he fought it all the way, don't you? But when he got down there, he says, I understand now, God's not a respecter of persons. And when Peter began to preach, did you notice over there in Acts chapter 10? I'm going to flip up back over there. Maybe you, I don't, I'm not going to ask the guys back there in the sound room to do this, okay? But, 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 but let, me, let me just tell you something. In Acts chapter 10 here, when Peter starts to testify to him from, from, from verse 36 all the way down through verse 41, you know what Peter does? He gives them the gospel message. How that Jesus Christ died for their sins. How that he was buried. That he rose again. That he's at the right hand of the throne. He gives the whole gospel message. And you know what? That's how those people got saved. 
Cornelius was already a devout man. He was already worshiping God. He was already giving his tithes and his offerings, and he had to probably do it through some Jews because the, the temple wouldn't have took him from him, okay? So he had to kind of come in the back door. He's helping these people out. He believes in their God, but these people are so stuck in their tradition and their interpretation of the law that they're not willing to reach out and to tell him the gospel message until God literally has to slap Peter and wake him up and say, Peter, when these guys get here, you go with them. And I think Peter's in awe when he tells the gospel message. And it says in verse 44, while Peter yet spake, the Holy Ghost fell on them just like he did them Jews down there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Shocked him to no end. You mean God's going to save the Gentiles? Praise God, he saves us. Praise God, he brings us out of sin just like he did the Jews. Praise God, he gives us the Holy Spirit just like he did them on the day of Pentecost. Thank God that Peter had enough spiritual discernment about him that he was willing to turn his back on tradition and to answer the call of God. Are you willing to turn your back on tradition and answer the call of God? Are you really willing to drop your, your incorrect interpretation of Scripture and listen to the voice of God and follow it? Listen, God will never ask you to do something that He does not like. The Spirit of God will never encourage you to do anything that breaks the laws of God. If you're in this for the long haul and you're going to serve God, you need to have some spiritual discernment about you and listen to what God says to you and watch what God shows to you and begin to do what God has called each of us to do, and that is to be a great witness to lost people in the world, no matter who they are, no matter who they are. Now, the church I grew in was, was pretty strict on clothes, okay, and how we dressed, but that was for us who attended the church all the time. Christian or not, we had to live by the dress code. Well, until we got teenagers and rebelled, and they loved us enough they didn't kick us out, okay? They prayed for us. They didn't like it much, okay? But they prayed for us. But I can assure you of this. That church was in downtown Indianapolis. I could take you right to the doors today. Still open, still a church. It's not the people I worship with. It's a whole different people because those people moved to another building. But we had a lot of people living in a neighborhood of different colors. We were taught that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We had buses and went out and picked up kids. You could smell them before they ever got on the bus. That didn't matter. We had them that came and barely had clothes to wear, let alone what we considered decent clothes. But we were taught that doesn't matter because God loves them just like he does all you guys. You don't say anything to them. You don't belittle them. You bring them in and you befriend them and you love them like you love one another. I'm thanking God that I was raised with that part. I just wish they hadn't told me I had to dress in a certain way. You know, I to this day still don't think it's a sin if a man wants to have his hair a little long, but it was wrong for me. You know why? Because I did it to show them I could do it. It's an attitude of your heart, right? It's an attitude of your heart. Some things are not wrong, but if we're told not to do it and we say, well, I'll show you, I'm going to do it anyway, wrong attitude, then it becomes sinful. Peter rebelled against going, but he finally said, you know what, God, maybe you're trying to tell me something. Has God ever tried to tell you something? Has he ever tried to wake you up? Maybe ask you to step out of your little box, out of your little paradigm and do something a little different? Oh, listen, be willing. Have spiritual discernment. Have spiritual discernment and say, God, if it's you speaking, I may have never done it this way. I may not think this is right, but God, if this is your direction, I'll do it. And if you'll do that, I tell you what, God will use you in a mighty way. Some of us are afraid to do that, aren't we? Scared to death. Oh, that might change the church. Let me tell you something. We could use some changing in some ways. I'm not saying in a bad way. I'm saying we could use some changing by getting some people that's got a little spirit and some life in them and encourage us a little bit and, and give us somebody we can teach and somebody we can mentor and somebody that we can lead through their life and help them grow to be better Christians. They asked Peter to stay, and you know what? Peter stayed. 
spiritual discernment. We all need it. I can tell you this. I didn't have much spiritual discernment until I became 19 years old. Say, you weren't very smart. Nope, sure wasn't. I've said it and I'll say it again. I had a bad disease called the stupids. I was eat up with it. And I did a lot of really stupid things. But you know what? There was a time that Jesus Christ sent his spirit to convict me of my sins. I had to have spiritual discernment at that point. I had to make a choice. Do I continue to live like I'm living? Or do I open my eyes and see the condition that I'm in? And do I give my life to Christ? That's spiritual discernment. I chose Christ. And I'm so glad I did. But there's been other times in my life. I've had to drop tradition. I've had to drop what I thought was right. Because God was asking me to do something else. I don't know what you struggle with in your life. But if you're struggling today... We never like to close on Sunday morning without allowing people a time to pray. We've got a beautiful place up here. It's just some boards and some fabric. And there's no power in it, but it's a great place to pray. It's a great place for God's people to gather around you if you have trouble today. Maybe you're struggling and God's trying to show you which way to go and, and you're just not open to that discernment. You just can't figure out what you need to do. God will help you with it. If you're in it for the long haul, he's going he's to change your direction once in a while. He's going to open your eyes to things you thought were wrong and show you those things aren't wrong. He also might open your eyes to things you thought were all right and show you they're wrong. You need spiritual discernment. I'm going to ask our uh, piano player and song leader to come this morning, and I want you to look in your own life. Listen, Peter was stubborn. He was probably the most stubborn of all of the disciples from everything we know about him. But he learned something that day. Because God kept showing him and he finally opened his eyes and said, you know what? God has shown me. It's not wrong to come and testify to you, Cornelius. And he said, God's shown me that he's no respecter of persons. Are you struggling with obeying what God has shown you? Why don't you come and ask him, God, just open my eyes. You know, that, that, that's a song we heard several years ago, you know. Uh, Michael W. Smith sang, open the, uh, no, it wasn't Michael, who was it? Somebody, it was, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Somebody help me out, who was it? Look it up, guys, in the sound room. Tell me after church. I know it wasn't Michael W. Smith. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Doesn't he need to do that today? Do your eyes, spiritual eyes, need to be opened on what needs to be done and where it needs to be done and how it needs to be done? That's spiritual discernment, and we need that in our church world today. If you need to pray, would you come as we stand and sing?